Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the new term of Milner Seminars, which will be running live each month. Um, today, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Professor Mike Spratton. Uh, Mike is a director of the Sanger Institute uh, and CEO of the Welcome Genome Campus. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society. He was knighted in 2013. His personal research is focused on uh, the genetics of cancer, uh, but today he will be speaking about the Sanger's scientific plans for 2021 to 2026. We thought this would be appropriate since the strategy for the Sanger and the Wellcome Trust are now shifting focus. And also because the Sanger is part of the Milner Therapeutics Consortium, which includes the University of Cambridge, the Babram Institute, and nine pharmaceutical companies. So understanding the Sanger's plans will be useful for setting up future collaborations. If you have any questions for Mike, please ask them using the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. So over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you for the uh, invitation to come today and to uh, present this sort of overview of our strategic plan. And the, the reason for having such a thing and for um, being able to give this talk is because, of course, Sanger and the whole organization that we're part of, which is called Genome Research Limited, is reviewed every five years by Wellcome. And we're just going through that quinquennial review. Um, it was delayed because of lockdown, but is now proceeding. And going through that quinquennial review has made us consider our future science and presented in the way I'm going to describe to you now. So this is our, our science for 2021-2026. It's uh, our review is of Genome Research Limited, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Wellcome. And that includes the Sanger Institute, Connecting Science, which is our uh, learning, training and public engagement initiative and also the Welcome Genome Campus Infrastructure and Services. They all come under the auspices of Genome Research Limited and the budgets for those are shown below. And the, most of it going to the Institute. The mission of GRL is to maximize the societal benefit of knowledge obtained from genome sequences. And that delivers on three constituent elements first is research, second is enterprise and innovation, and the third is learning and engagement. And all of those three elements pertain to genomes and biodata, which is the theme that applies to everything at Sanger, at GRL, and on the Wellcome Genome Campus now and in the future. So I'll take each of those components in turn. The major one is, of course, the Sanger Institute itself. And the Institute's mission is to use information from genome sequences to advance understanding of biology and improve health. So this looks like the mission statement of an awful lot of uh, biomedical research organizations with the difference, the main difference with those, that pair of words of genome sequences in there. There is a kind of strategic profile which describes the way that we, um, that we generally operate. Um, I'm just trying to move the things. Um, to deliver our mission, Sanger has to be an ideas factory, by which it, I mean that our faculty need to identify new frontiers of biology, new landscapes and application which can be uh, elucidated, thrown light on through genome sequences. It has to be at the leading edge of development, application and implementation of genomics technologies. We must conduct research characterized by large scale data production that cannot easily be conducted elsewhere. And that those last few words of cannot easily be conducted elsewhere is very important for the Institute. It's what justifies our core funding from Welcome be expert in aggregation and analysis and interpretation of large quantities of genomic data. We obviously do have to do that to analyze the data that we generate. But it makes me emphasize that Sanger is a, is a data generation institute and we have to be expert in 
the computational work in order to analyze these data but we're not really in the business of having faculty members who only um, modus operandi is analyzing other people's data. All our faculty need to be able to look at the sector of biology that they're interested in and come up with new questions to address through the generation of new uh, genomic data. We initiate and participate in nat major national and international collaborative research initiatives, and we incubate <clears throat> the next generation of scientists and clinicians in genome research. So that's our strategic profile. <clears throat> there are three overall major goals of our science, if you look through the whole portfolio. The first is to provide new insights into normal human biology. The second is to enhance understanding of the pathogenesis of human disease thus providing a scientific basis for improving disease prevention and management. And the third, which is really the major new departure in this quinquennium, is to elucidate the evolutionary tree of life on Earth, advancing the scientific knowledge base for management of the living environment and for synthetic genomics. And we use a limited number of major experimental approaches to do this. The first is the analysis of DNA sequence differences between the individual genomes of the same species. So those differences in G DNA sequence can be um, naturally occurring or engineered, inherited or somatically acquired. They can be differences between individual human beings, between individual isolates of disease causing microbes or their vectors, and or between individual cells. The second is the analysis of gene expression and epigenomic features of the genome at the single cell level. And the third is the generation and analysis of reference genomes across the tree of life. And to do that, we use a very limited set of core technologies which are optimized for delivery at large scale. First, of course, is nucleic acid sequencing. Second is large scale mutagenesis. We apply the mutagenesis generally in cell culture, in cells grown often at scale, large numbers of different cell lines. And the new part of our technology um, portfolio is to begin to develop microscopic spatial imaging of nucleic acid profiles of cells and tissues. In other words, to be able to look at individual cells and show what their expression profiles are or even what their mutations in their genomes are. All of that is um, overseen by computational analysis of the data generated. And for that, we have a small number of large scale data generation and data analysis platforms, the sequencing facility, the cell, live cell generation and phenotyping facility, the microscopy facility is a twinkle in our eye. Just in one way or another, we will be developing that over the next several years and the data center. The one element that is not mentioned here, which is, is the, um, the animal facility, which you may have heard over the last couple of years, we are now in the process of shutting down and will be shut by um, next September. So the science at Sanger is grouped into five scientific programs, each of which encompasses a major sector of biology or disease to which genomics will make a transformative contribution. Why five programs? Um, five is a balance between maximizing the breadth of scientific impact and on the other hand, concentrating resources in order to achieve science at scale. We've asked for the science in these five programs to be constituted of two projects, just two projects for each program, and each of those projects involves multiple faculty. So this structure embodies that vision of strategic scientific initiatives conducted at scale, um, encouraging our faculty to think large and to make strategic choices to engage in a small number of large initiatives rather than a large number of small initiatives. 
and it also embodies the culture of coordinated science and collective endeavor. So these are the five scientific programs, cancer aging and somatic mutation, cellular genetics, human genetics, parasites and microbes, and the new program for uh, the forthcoming from Crenium, the Tree of Life. So the Institute has 35 faculty, or that's what we aim for. We're slightly less than that at the moment. They are our scientific thought leaders. And each of these five programs has equal importance and indeed equal, essentially equal allocation of resources within the um, science budget. And therefore, each of them has seven faculty envisaged. And those faculty range from the most junior, half of them being the most senior and half being more junior faculty. So 35 faculty overall in the five programs with approximately 70 graduate students, 120 postdocs. There are almost 300 people at Sanger in the science platforms, the sequencing facility, the cell facility, the IT, and the Institute as a whole is constituted of just over a thousand people. So with respect to the cancer, aging and somatic mutation, program, as I've said, each one of these has, each program has two projects. Each project has three aims. I'm not going to show you the aims. I'm just going to describe at high level these projects. So for the Cancer Aging Somatic Mutation Program, the first project is really about characterizing somatic mutations in normal tissues. That can be in health. It can be it is in health, it will be in a variety of diseases, cancer and um, non-cancer diseases across the lifespan in humans and other species. So this is really trying to understand how somatic mutagenesis in our bodies throughout life contributes or is affected by the wide range of human disease. The second project is called, is, is, termed as assessing the functional consequences of mutation in mutations in cancer using cellular models. And these, this really embodies two major um, mutagenesis initiatives using CRISPR-Cas technology. One in which there will be genome-wide um, screens for uh, genes which are essential in a wide variety of cellular models. And the second, um, saturation mutagenesis of genes which are known to be mutated and contributing to the development of cancer. And that saturation mutagenesis to create every amino acid change in these, this set of genes provides, on one hand, functional information about the, the protein and the, the key amino acids within it, but also is supposed to provide information for, of clinical use where allowing one to understand better um, amino acid substitutions, mutations found in cancer, of which the significance is uncertain and providing functional data as to whether those um, changes do have impact. So the second program, cellular genetics, again, two overarching projects. The first is defining cell types and their interactions through single cell transcriptomics. So this is essentially contributing to the adult human cell atlas, which you will know is a large scale international um, initiative, which is jointly led from um, Broad and from Sanger. So the first project is about adult cell types the second is about understanding human development through single cell transcriptomics, taking individual stages of um, embryological development and also taking individual tissues as they develop through, um, through fetal life. The third program is human genetics. Again, these two projects, the first is the extension of what um, Sanger has been doing for a number of years now, understanding developmental disorders, in other words, genetic abnormal 
um, inherited genes that cause abnormalities of development, the wide range of phenotypes that that includes. Continuing over the next five years and increasing the numbers of cases from which we have sequences in order to identify genes which um, con when mutated contribute to developmental disorders, but now also in this project um, beginning to um, study those genes in more detail, again using technologies generating saturation mutagenesis of those genes, understanding the key amino acid changes that will change the function of those genes, and again contributing to clinical um, understanding, um, finding out whether variants of unknown significance when um, mutated into the gene and in, in cellular models do have biological consequences. And the second project, which is more about common disease and more com common phenotypes and indeed um, inherited normal traits, is about defining the biological basis of complex traits and disease of blood and immunity using population scale genomics. Fourth program is parasites and microbes. Again, two projects. The big theme and thematic change in the, this program is about longitudinal surveillance, longitudinal systematic and really real-time surveillance of uh, major disease-causing pathogens over time. So in project one, this will be sequencing very large numbers of relevant um, organisms um, across the globe. In this, for project one, applied to the malaria parasite, Plasmodium, to the Nopheles mosquito, and to a number of other parasitic uh, disease-causing organisms, helminthic worms and others. And the second project, again, embodying that theme of longitudinal surveillance, which allows one to see really evolution in an organism in the wild occurring as we watch it and watching it go forward. Also allowing one to provide information to public health authorities um, in a form in which they can understand where we begin to see changes that suggest there are resistant clones emerging or other changes in the population that um, local health authorities across the world would want to be uh, informed of and could act on. And for project two, that will apply to cholera, uh, to the pneumococcus, and also to the uh, microbiome, particularly in children. And finally, the, the new program, the Tree of Life program, Again, two projects. The first one is essentially doing the tree of life. So that is sequencing, um, assembling and annotating the trees of life. The major aim of this, um, the whole project is um, embedded in the Earth Biogenome Project, with which, is, which is a global endeavor, aiming to sequence all the one and a half million um, eukaryotic species that are, have a name to them at this moment. There are probably about, I don't know, 10 million or more in, in reality, but there are about a million and a half eukaryotic species that we have a name to. The aim of this project at Sanger is to really provide, I think, global leadership in this by doing what has been named the Darwin Tree of Life, which will be sequencing the 60,000 eukaryotic species, so animals, plants, and fungi that exist in the, um, in the UK and in Ireland. So that is the first part of that is actually doing it and releasing it in those um, interpretable and usable forms. The second part will be to build science on the basis of those trees of life, um, understanding genomic diversity, species dynamics over space and time and rules of evolution of genomic structure. So this will be taking certain groups of organisms, a large number of insects, and by barcoding them, following them over time and space in a number of different uh, geographical locations and seeing how that shifts. The second part of that will be looking at um, 
parasitism. A very large proportion of eukaryotes are actually apparently parasites. So understanding how parasitism and symbiosis generally, generally impacts on genomes and how genomes accommodate to that. And the third is understanding essentially the evolution of chromosomes. So those are the five um, core scientific programs. We have two major externally funded initiatives, which are associate research programs. The first is Open Targets, which is a collaboration between Sanger EBI and a consortium of uh, pharmaceutical companies, of whom the current members are shown there. The aim of which is to identify um, therapeutic targets on the basis of genome variation, genomes generally, and then to, um, to validate them and provide new targets for pharmaceutical companies to follow up. All the data from open targets is open. Um, and then HDR UK, we're a node together with EBI and the University of Cambridge and Cambridge Healthcare Trust to develop um, the HDR UK initiative in genomics. So these cut across all Sanger research programs, um, bringing in ideas, new ideas, new challenges, new scientists, and new ways of working. One um, strategic component that probably is going to be with us for uh, a while is, is the coronavirus. Um, of course, much of the biological com research community is working on coronavirus. Our contribution has been to develop a, an initiative to sequence the coronavirus at scale. Um, this was made possible, obviously, in the first, um, um, in the first phase, in, for initially by the fact by Sanger's infrastructure and um, in intellectual environment. But then by the um, advent of the Lighthouse Pillar 2 testing centers, from which um, tens, hundreds of thousands of tests are done each day. And what we offered them was to take all their waste material, in other words, all the test, all the RNAs that they had done their testing on. We pick um, positive samples from those and sequence the virus. So as you can see from that plot there, about half of the coronavirus sequences in the world thus far have been done in the UK um, as part of the COVID-19 Genomics UK consortium. And of about of those, about half have been done by Sanger and we are ramping up. The two, we aim this, we envisage this continuing at least over the next couple of years with two main goals. One is to use that, um, that genomics to be able to identify clusters of super spreaders really early, even before one is aware that there is a cluster happening, even before the testing suggests there's a cluster happening because the genomes in those clusters are homogeneous. There isn't a diversity of genome sequences. There is one that seems to be expanding. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a proposal that we can do this. We have got the throughput of sequencing to do it, but whether it will work in real time over the next um, two years is a matter of doing the research and generating the data that hopefully will manage the pandemic, both of them on the fly. And the second reason for doing it is to monitor the, the viral population in the UK in real time. So we aim to do this in turnaround of, well, currently it's just under two weeks. So we aim to bring that down to one week and if possibly less, such that um, we can start to detect vaccine escape mutants early when the vaccines hopefully are introduced soon. And if vaccine escape turns out to be a problem. So that's the portfolio of science within Sanger. I mentioned that uh, Genome Research Limited has three components. Connecting Science is our learning and public engagement initiative. To those two components, training and learning, embodied by the uh, advanced courses and scientific conferences, which many of you will have attended. Both of these are quite mature initiatives. The major changes 
really are occurring to the advanced courses, um, which were previously delivered on the Hingston campus. Over the last few years, they've increasingly been delivered elsewhere, particularly in low and middle income countries. And then increasingly by individuals who come from those low and middle income countries. And now, of course, as many of these courses and some of the conferences too, are going to be delivered uh, virtually. And then the engagement um, part of connecting science, this involves ethics and societal research, um, particularly with respect to attitudes to genomics um, and to the use of genomics and genome information. And then um, a very wide range of public engagement activities, all of the work in connecting sciences elsewhere in genome GRL is on, under the auspices of genomes and biodata. So finally, we come to the Welcome Genome Campus, shown from the air here. Um, the campus now includes about two and a half thousand people, of whom about, just as I said previously, about a thousand of them are at Sanger. Um, the campus includes, in addition to Sanger, of course, EMBL EBI, the Connecting Science Initiative. We have the Sequencing Center of Genomics England, which is run by Illumina. And then there is the Biodata Innovation Center, which is this building to the right-hand side, which, which is for small to medium-sized companies, again, all working in the field of genomes and biodata, and those companies are listed there. So that's the campus as it is now. We have developed a 25-year um, uh, vision for the campus. Um, the intent is that that uh, grayed out triangle at the top right will become, an ex will be developed as a new part of the campus, extending it very substantially. That field is owned by Welcome, and we have, over the last um, couple of years, got through a series of processes accelerated by South Cambridgeshire Council to allow us to plan and to make those developments. And we're waiting for the final, over the next um, month or two, the final um, okay from the council to proceed with that process. So that will be for new research organizations we envisage the whole campus, old and new, to function as one. With new research organizations at the centerpiece of it, we envisage a major public engagement and training initiative, again, with applying to genomes and biodata, more commercial space, potentially um, a major industrial partner. We often have the discussion if, if we can get to that stage of considering a major industrial partner, would that be um, you know, a part of a ph uh, pharmaceutical company or would it be part of a data company? There are sort of uh, arguments to be had for both. And associated with the campus, there will be about 1,000 to 1,500 homes for people working on the campus. So this will entail about a threefold increase of the campus footprint, a threefold increase in people to about 7,000, the 1,500 houses, the facilities that will be needed to go with them, GP surgery, primary school, and shops, and in general, a sort of forward-looking conception of a middle to late 21st century work and residential community. So for all of the um, activities of Genome Research Limited in the next five years and future, we have developed and are still developing actually this idea of an impact framework, which is really for us, but also others to be able to look at the aspirations that we have and to see just well how well we're delivering on them. And so there are nine of these um, goals to deliver that mission. First, at the 12 o'clock is, of course, to conduct leading edge research, but then to develop new scientific leaders, to lead on global major challenges, 
to support a wider ecosystem that realizes the benefits of genome and bio, genomes and biodata to, if we can, change clinical practice and the way that um, clinicians think, to share expertise through our various training initiatives, to enable public dialogues, to champion and continue to champion as um, Sanger and Wellcome has done over the last 25 years, an open research culture and open data, and to continue to help shape standards and policy. So those are the seven, the nine areas in which we are um, attempting to review ourselves and we accumulate data and um, um, look at that data now on a yearly basis to provide those assessments for ourselves and for others. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Mike, and a virtual clapping uh, from me. Um, I'm going to we're going to ask some questions now. And I, um, while people are asking questions on chat, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I've got. Um, the first one is fairly short, which is, do you think are your five programs? Are you focusing all of them on all of them equally? Or is your idea that this will shift towards the newer strategies, given that um, Welcome is moving into certain directions, which are the new directions that you're going into, uh, will the old directions like cancer work be downgraded in the future and the others elevated? Um, well, we have very explicitly in the formulation of these um, proposals allocated equal budget and stated that each of these programs is of equal importance to the Institute and its science and the way we see ourselves in, in, the, um, in the wider scientific environment. Um, just because you have um, mentioned Welcome's strategy released earlier this week, I mean, the, the highlights of what they released were the areas that they are of change, if you like, with um, perhaps a greater focus on infectious diseases, on mental health, and then global warming. And then, so those are the kind of new directions of travel. And then some of the things they also highlighted that the things they're gonna shut down, like certain ways the science pro programs are gonna be, uh, the science funding is gonna be distributed. But alongside all those, there is an intention from Welcome to continue a lot of work as it has been in the past. And so the work on, you know, basic scientific, fundamental scientific research, the intention is to conti continue with that in a very substantial way. And right. that would apply exactly to the other programs that are not so clearly um, linked to Welcome to New Strategy. Great, that's good to know. I've got one more question, which is more global again, which is you generating a lot of data. Um, and the, my question is, when, when can the outside world interact with you and look at that data? At what point along the line can one access, collaborate with you in order to access data sets that are obviously taking a long time to mature? Uh, do we need to wait till you publish or can we interact and ask for collaborations or just to look at the data sets? Yeah, um, well, we have a, a rule, which is that um, our data should be released within six months of being generated. And, you know, because of the nature of these things, it doesn't always work, but it is supposed to be built in and automated, such that the data goes automatically on a date stamp after it has come through certain elements of quality control it should go into EGA, the human data at least. So um, from that perspective, you know, those are BAM files, they are they're sequencing and they are, um, you know, not always so easy to use, but th those data, as I say, go out automatically. If there is an awareness of other data that we're generating, or there's data, an awareness of what data we're generating and you want to collaborate earlier than that, then we're always open to that, yeah but certainly not waiting for publication. Yeah. Great. 
Thank you, Mike. I'm now going to hand you over to Alison, who's going to look at the chat and see um, other questions coming up. Alison. Thanks, Tony. So yes, we've got a couple of questions here. The first is from Robert Neely. He says, hi, Mike. It would be really interesting to hear a little more about the microscopy approaches you plan to use and mm. how you plan to integrate the imaging and sequencing data. Oh, well, you would need to ask the people who are um, leading in that line, but um, it's because the initiative is really at such a, well, it's an, a very early stage. So I can only really reiterate because re re I'm not so familiar with the actual technologies, that um, the aim is really with um, to be able to assess ideally the tr whole transcriptome of individual cells and to then use the spatial positioning of those cells in order to understand how the cell its environment, the cells around it, influence gene expression. Also, as I said, to understand lineages of cells if we were looking at the genomes. But I can't answer your question. If you'll need to speak to the people who, who can. Thank you. So the next question is from Ian Seeley. It says, how much of Sanger se sequencing capacity is being used for COG and how much of an effect will COG have on the five programs? Um, it's about, um, so it, it is a significant amount of our, um, it's a, a significant amount of our capacity. It's not of the sequencers because we have um, a lot of sequencing capacity and the, the sequencing of the COVID-19 genomes accounts doesn't really take up much space in that. The place where the bottleneck arises with respect to the coronavirus is in the library formation because we are making very large numbers of libraries, you know, thousands a week at the moment. So that's where the bottleneck really comes in and that's where it is um, impacting on the rest of um, Sanger science. Um, the reason I'm slightly hesitating is because the the numbers are changing. Um, as you may know, when we all went into lockdown, we, we continued, we, the only thing that did continue running at Sanger was, or started then, was the COVID-19 sequencing, everything else shut down. Subsequently, as we have all come out of lockdown, the COVID-19 sequencing has continued, but Sanger's other science is now, has now come back. Um, and at the same time, we have um, invested further in all the pipelines to um, broaden them, to make the, the capacity bigger than it was um, prior to lockdown in order that the um, impact of the COVID-19 sequencing is mitigated for the rest of the science. But I think in the, um, um, the library making capacity, it is taking something like 20% um, or something of that nature. Thank you. That's really helpful. Uh, there's a question here. It says, thank you for your talk from Efrosini Gitrana. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing the name properly. Aligned with the new um, WCT, new approach to funding more junior researchers, how will you approach bringing new talent into the WCT, especially clinicians? Mm. Um, well, we are actually, we have been thinking about that for a while. The, um, um, as I said, we have 30, we have 35 faculty, we have three levels of faculty and about, I suppose, a third of our faculty are really um, the most junior level of so-called group leaders, what group leader one, these would be individuals who have, um, you know, done one, maybe two postdocs, and this would be their first opportunity to establish um, their own group. So that's our main platform for that transition from being doing research as part of someone else's group and to doing being to independence. I think what we have found really quite fruitful over the last several years, both in the context of clinicians and those not clinically trained 
is, is the career development um, fellowships from, from other organizations and in terms of the clinicians from, from Welcome. And this is an area that we have found so fruitful that we are hoping to expand that. Um, again, mainly from external funding, but providing the, the space and facilities for more uh, career development fellows to come in at that sort of level before they get to so this would be immediately post a postdoc or immediately post PhD for a clinician to have that first really with a very small group. Thank you. There's a second part to the question. Um, the, if the COG will continue to focus on SARS-CoV-2, will there be any core work on other viruses? Um, well, we, we don't have work as you heard on, on viruses but it is you know it's an interesting question that is being asked we have um, over the last two three months been thinking what the advent of the coronavirus would mean for the parasites and microbes program and we don't really we haven't really come to a conclusion we have a plan for the next two years as I sort of outlined to you to sequence the virus in the UK to do the things that I described, but um, whether that would become a long-term, so A, a long-term coronavirus program is one possibility, you know, that the virus may be with us for a decade or more, it may become endemic and it may continue to provide challenges to us, in which case that would justify it. The second is, as you're asking whether um, the kind of illustration to us all of the perils of um, viral pandemics should mean that we now adopt a, a broader virus program. It's not completely clear that that's what we should be doing, but we have been thinking on that score. And the third is a kind of just wider than that, which is that um, whether we should be thinking over the next five years of, you know, how does one design a new piece of work around emerging infections that's or predicting which infections are likely to emerge so those are the three areas of thinking that have started they certainly haven't come to any um, conclusion thank you uh, there's another question here if we I think we just about have time um, as part of the future growth of the campus will there be an opportunity for expansion of spin outs through a genomic technology focused accelerator um, well whether there's an accelerator as, as a specific thing I uh, you know that's to be seen but definitely the answer to that is yes with the um, the whole point really the major um, reason for the development of the campus in this way is that yes in addition there will be new fundamental research but it will be I think a disproportionate increase in the um, component of activity on the campus that is that is commercial and that will be I think the most straightforward part to drive through initially will be the small and medium sized enterprises I think the next part will be to provide space for um, those small or medium sized enterprises that have moved on to the next size. And we are already struggling with that. Um, companies that may have, you know, 100 people and going up from that, we don't have um, the, the space for that at the moment. So that would be alongside more space for SMEs. And then, as I said, we have penciled in whether there's the opportunity for a major, uh, a major industrial partner on the campus with us. Thank you. That's really exciting to hear about the expansion plans. I think if um, there are no further questions at this moment, which is actually perfect timing. Um, so I think, Tony, I'm going to hand back to you now and just say thank you so much to Mike. Thank you, Alison, and uh, thank you, Mike, for joining us and sharing your plans. 
it will be very interesting to see how your new strategy affects uh, research in Cambridge and the rest of the UK. So I think these are very interesting time for all of us, um, not just you, but everybody. Yeah. So thank well, you thank once again. Thank um, you very much for inviting me, Tony. It's, um, I, I look forward to um, further interactions on, on, compared to what we've had in the past and um, generally, genuinely appreciate that you've invited me here today to outline the stuff. Lovely. Thank you, Mike. And thank you all of you for joining and uh, keep safe. Bye-bye.